the proficiency rate for eighth grade black boys was 18%. For white eighth grade boys, it's 19%. Maybe there are other factors outside of race, class, and gender driving these outcomes. Ian Rowe, thanks for coming to AEI and talking to me. Great. Uh, great to see you. Yeah. So, How you doing? Ian, you are CEO of Public Prep, yes. which is uh, the, the largest and oldest national network, the only national charter network of single sex elementary and middle schools. Is that right? That is correct. Tell me. What are you doing at Public Prep, and how is it different from other charter schools in New York City? Uh, sure. Well, the fact that we are the, the oldest and sure. only network, that uh, in, un, unto itself makes us different. Right. Um, like other charter school networks, we are uh, obsessed with ensuring that our students remain on a path to college completion. Right. So we are pre-K through 8. Um, and yet stay what's connected to our kids even when they're in high school and now our first cohorts are entering college which is very exciting. Yeah. We have about 2,000 students uh, right. in our all girls and our all boys schools right. uh, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan and in the heart of the South Bronx. And how many campuses do you have? We have six campuses okay. right now. Um, you know, right on, uh, you know, right in Hunt Point uh, in the Bronx and Lower East Side and you know, the vast majority of our kids uh, come from low-income backgrounds, predominantly uh, kids of color, and we have the highest of expectations of them. And we're really proud to say that the first cohort, so we started in 2005 with 45 kindergarten students and 45 first graders, and uh, in 2013, we graduated 47 uh, of those original first graders, meaning that we accepted. That's amazing. Yeah, we, uh, we accepted students along the way. Sure. Um, and then last year, that first cohort, uh, 43 out of those 47, so 90% of the original cohort of that, of that graduated from our schools in eighth grade entered some of the best colleges and universities in the country. So Yale, Howard, and we'll soon be announcing that the cohort that started in kindergarten right. in 2005 uh, 45, we graduated 65 of those, uh, those students right. uh, in 2014, and we'll soon be announcing that more than 91% of that uh, class is now heading to some of the That's best That's fantastic. Colleges. Yeah. So, so I'm, you're I'm really topping out at 90%. That. Now, that is, uh, that is a fantastic track record, but I've heard this before, right? Charter yes, school, have. focusing on, on uh, kids with low opportunities, delivering for them, expecting a lot. Um, but public prep is doing more than just that that sets it apart. So Well, I mean, we we we, we um so we agree that these are these are interim uh, achievements because right. at the end of the day we want to see not only are our kids going to complete college where they're going to be in terms of life success, right? right? And when we say complete college, we mean complete college in four years. Many right. other schools use a six-year metric right. for a four-year and that that But even that is your interim goal because your that, long-term goal is this diffuse idea of success in life. Yes. Right. And success in life can be defined economically, it can be defined in terms of the strength of your family. There right. are many dimensions. We want our kids to be empathetic, resilient, uh, bold, intellectually curious right. um, girls and boys. And so it's incumbent upon us, if that's the end goal, to do more than just teach about math and reading, right? It's important to ensure that our students have the kinds of uh, immersive experiences that may place them in environments that they may not be used to at home, um, or ensure that they get exposure to information that they may not be getting through other institutions. I can talk about some right. of these things to ensure that by the time that they graduate from eighth grade, they have the armor, the information, the self-confidence, the self-regulation skills, all those sort of non-cognitive, um, even though we sort of hate that term because character-based strengths are very related to your cognitive and academic sure. ability. Um, but all of those are part of a package that ensures that you have the ability to overcome the inevitable hurdles that one will face in high school, in college, and in life. So how do you teach this stuff? Is this just part of public preps culture or do you teach it explicitly in classes? Uh, how do you 
impart these things yeah. uh, just so, through school. Yeah, so, so, there, so as you might imagine, there are a lot of different touch points, right? right? So in some ways, you want to create a future orientation, right. right? So one example of that is that starting in pre-K, we work with all of our families to open New York State 529 college savings accounts. Okay. And we have $50 that we match, and we create a, uh, an economic incentive for a family to say, even for your four-year-old, we are thinking about when that student is going to be graduating from high school 12, 13 years right. from now. And that's one of multiple little and small things that we do yeah. to reinforce this idea that self-control today means lots of benefit later. Right. And our four core values, you know, responsibility, uh, scholarship, merithood, and sist sisterhood or brotherhood, right. these are all parts of elements that we do to ensure that, again, obviously academics are critical, um, but your ability to persevere, to, to have a determined effort to achieve your goal, those are the kinds of things that we believe ultimately are useful not only in academic success, but in virtually every other kind of challenge that one encounters. Sure, absolutely. So you guys are making some bets, and I want to ask about two of the bets you've made. One, you've been making some bets where you're willing to spend more money than you may have to on your home visiting program. Yes, So I want to hear about your home visiting program. Yep. And then after that, uh, you're, I, I want to hear about the bets you're willing to make and yeah. the stand you're willing to take on the yeah. success sequence. So sure, help sure. Me so um, so home visiting is something that's actually been part of the DNA of girls prep and boys prep from the very beginning, right. from when we first started in 2005. And that's something that we did every single student every year. Uh, we, you know, the mountain goes to Muhammad. We go to the home, we, we, we spend time with whomever the caregivers are, and we talk about the commitment that we will be making as a school to your son or daughter. In return, we also ask for the caregiver to say, this is what we need from you. Because the thing is, schools, we cannot do this alone. We need the full participation of families because as much time as we have with our kids, they spend more time at home. So sure. the home visiting component of what we do has always been critical. We've added a new element this year, which is that um, even at four years old, when uh, students come into pre-K, we notice that they are, do not always have access to the vocabulary or the social emotional development. Sure. Some of our families do, and, and yeah. they're you know, very stable situations, but not all, right. right? And so we've been trying to think about how do we create a better environment, even for those younger siblings of our current students who are not even in our schools yet. Right, so under four years old. Under four years old. Gotcha. So we've created a partnership with the Parent Child Home Program, which has been a home visiting literacy based program that's been around for 50 years, has, has a long evidence base. Right. And so we now are the first charter network to say to the younger siblings of our current boys prep or girls prep students, especially in the Bronx, right. that if you've got a younger sibling at home that's 18 months old, for two years, an early literacy specialist will go to your home, spend time with the caregiver and your child twice per week, 30 minutes per visit, to literally sit with you to talk about how do you create a literacy-rich environment at home? How do you physically build a library? How do you take advantage of your trips to the supermarket or the local bodega, whatever it is, sure. to use that as a learning opportunity to build the vocabulary of that 18-month-old student? We're making the bet. Uh, we're making the bet that even before that 18-month-old is a student, that two years from now, because we know that that uh, student will have preference in our lottery, sibling preference, sibling preference, yep. they will have guaranteed entry. Now, it's possible that a, a family may move, but since we have such high retention, right. we believe that that's going to have a significant impact on the readiness levels right. of the kids that are entering our schools. But you're taking on those costs. That's a bet that you guys are making. It is. It is so critical. I mean, it would be amazing if there was a public funding stream that sure. recognized, because I think there is this belief somehow that school systems starting in kindergarten, we just have to accept kids where they are. Right. And we just know that particularly in ages zero to three, the, the science on brain development, so much work that's happening in those very, very early years yep. before children enter formal schooling, if we can reach back, if districts and charter networks like ours can reach back in highly effective research-based ways, such sure. as this parent-child home visiting program, we believe that that can have a dramatic impact on kids as they enter pre-K or kindergarten. So that's how you're looking back. Yep. 
Talk to me about the se success sequence yeah. and looking forward. So, you know, so we, and there's a little bit of a backstory sure. here. So, um, so our um, growth, you know, we started in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, right. then when our growth was in the South Bronx. And when you look at the South Bronx as um, uh, a neighborhood of opportunity, um, it's pretty challenging. So yeah. there's data that if you're a boy in per particular districts in the South Bronx, if you're a boy and you start ninth grade, only 2% four years later will graduate from high school ready for college. Meaning that you started ninth grade and you never, uh, you dropped out, you didn't graduate high right. school at all, or you did finish, but the degree, the high school degree that you earned didn't get did that. not empower you to do reading right. or math at a level that didn't require remediation gotcha. once you got into college. So for us... And that's a 2% threshold. Yeah. I mean, so it's hard to do worse than Them's that, Them's right? long odds. Yeah. It's pretty challenging. Yeah. And so our belief was we should have our, any growth that we do right. should be in, in neighborhoods that have that massive a need. Gotcha. And so we decided to move our headquarters, the public prep headquarters, from lovely Tribeca yeah. to the heart of the South Bronx, right. right on 149th Street, 3rd Avenue. All right. and, um, and so we decided to do a little walking tour of the team to just to get to know the neighborhood. Like, right. where's the local deli? Where's the bank? Gotcha. Just so we would get to know the neighborhood. And as we were walking, I saw this 27-foot Winnebago baby blue truck that people were excited, like, oh my gosh, that there's the truck. And I was like, what is this? It's almost like the ice cream truck, right? right? And um, but it had the wor these words emblazoned on the side, who's your daddy? And I said, what? What, what is that? Yeah. Um, and as it turned out, the Who's Your Daddy was a mobile DNA testing center where um, the, the guy who started it, you know, has a thriving business. So this, I saw the first truck. They've since opened up a second truck. And the uh, service is actually identifying who is your daddy? That's exactly what it is. And it costs between $350 to $500 where people are using the service to answer questions such as, who is my father, or are you my father, are you my sibling? Um, and, and it was the kind of thing that, literally, like, how can this be? Sure. Um, and so as I saw that, and over time learned that even though this truck existed in the South Bronx, the phenomenon that it represented was something that was emblematic of, of this kind of uh, phenomena happening all across the country. Right. Specifically, specifically as it relates to non-marital birth rates, right. particularly amongst young women and men aged 24 and under. So you're talking about birth outside of marriage or underage birth? What is it exactly the phenomenon? That so it's a combination of yeah. the two. So it's non-marital births below a certain age, gotcha. right? I mean, most people uh, agree that the unbelievable success of the teen pregnancy um, uh, effort over the last few decades has had enormous impact. Because most people agree that having a child at 16 years old right. is probably not a good outcome for the yep. child Leads nor the child, right? right? Many of those same uh, characteristics exist for a woman or a man age 24 and under who's non-married. Right. And in fact, if you look at the data across race, the percentages are staggering. Right. So among whites, so there are about 800,000 to 900,000 uh, births each year right. to women and men age 24 and under okay. across race. So 60% right. of white um, births age uh, 24 and under to white kids are, are, are non-marital births. Among the black community, it's 90%. I mean, but it, I mean, among Hispanics, it's about 70%. So across the board. But it's a, it's a vast majority across all races. That's the point, right. right? And when I thought about the schools that we are building, there's a lot of things that schools can do and overcome. We can, we can get our kids to certain levels academically, very high expectations, really focus on uh, character development, all the things that we just talked about in core values. But as a school, we cannot ignore these cultural shifts that have happened over the last five decades to know that, it, particularly as it relates to these shifts in family structure, right have a fundamental impact on things like what happens age zero to three sure. for our kids and what happens even afterwards. So this is a contest, you're gonna, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, this yeah. is a contested point of view. You yes. might get a little pushback yes. when you put out the importance of family structure. Yep. Um, what kind of pushback have you experienced and have you gotten? And you know, how do you react to it? How do you try and um, not defend it, but make clear what you are arguing? 
Yeah, you know, what's, what's interesting, so a few years ago, uh, Ron Haskins and Isabel Sawhill at the Brookings Institution right. were also asking this question about, so we've studied failure ad nauseum, right. right? You know, why are people, you know, why does entrenched poverty just continue, continue, continue? Right. So they asked an interesting question, like, is there a data set of people who have uh, been in poverty, and most notably children, and over time have emerged into the middle class and beyond and sustained that presence? Right. Is there, is, there a, is there any data out there? And, and if there is, is there anything that helps to define any kind of behaviors that led to that transition. Right. So they moved from su studying failure to stud studying success. Yeah, and guess what they found? There's actually a set of behaviors that for many people is common sense and what you practice every single day, but it's pretty overwhelming. So they identified that there were these three or four behaviors, right? One, finish your education. So in the study, it's mostly high school. I think, I think you know, we believe college is the new sure. high school. So, you know, finish college, full-time job of any kind, um, just so you learn the dignity and discipline of work uh, right. and all those responsibilities, marriage, then children, in that order. In that order. That's what the data says, right? There are other iterations that, you know, don't get married, but don't have children, right? Sure. So, so there are other iterations, and that's kind of the point, that they have shown that there are correlations of likely success based on different uh, orderings of those decisions, right. right? And so, for us, um, when we when we think about this, where are kids actually hearing this information? Where where are kids getting uh, uh, the fact that there are rewards or consequences associated with certain life choices? It used to be that the institutions through which kids learned this information might have been within their own family, right. it might have been within a faith-based institution, right. it might have been in their neighborhood, it might have been in popular media, right. but generally those institutions aren't reinforcing those messages. In fact, you could argue that they're re reinforcing something very different about right. what is valued. Yes. Um, and so, if not us, who? when I think about public education, because we're the remaining institution that actually has kids right. in our doors every single day. So we've um, decided to pilot, and, and there's lots of pushback, even within my own organization, right. of how can we do this? This is not the role of school. You're moralizing. You're, we, we run the risk of offending uh, the very children and families that we're working so hard right. Criticizing. Uh, to serve, yeah. right? But that's, not, but that's not what we're doing at all. Right. Um, and one of the things that's so important about this is to actually have a conversation with parents right. to say, regardless of decisions or, the, or decisions or a situation that you found yourself in that may have led you down a certain road, our belief is that most of our parents actually want us to be the adult in the room in the sense of we won't let the fear of offending people or the fear of being, uh, being accused of more, you know, blaming the victim, we actually won't let that deprive the very young people who, who would benefit from this kind of information. We have to have the courage to share that. So, Ian, there's a number of things that we have studied, we the general we, um, gender, race, poverty. These are sort of standard me metrics. When I'm talking about running a model, I say put in the usual suspects, right? These are the, the, the normal things. Family structure sometimes is in there, but it's not one of the mainstays. Um, you've talked before about the need to enter family structure on there. Now that's a contested notion, but can you make the case? Why do we need to know more about family structure from a statistical point of view when we are looking at the outcomes that our educational systems yeah, are putting it's out. Yeah, it's a really profound and important question because if you look at any data set and you say, look, the usual suspects are, are we, we, we believe the world exists through the prism of race, class, or gender, right? So if there's a racial achievement gap, then that must be driven by some kind of race-based explanation. Either it's racism or some people, it, it's the inherent inferiority of races, like it, right. it, it, which is absolutely wrong, right. right? And yet there might be something that's as fundamental to human development that goes underneath all of these right. things. And so almost every other sector, like the CDC just recently uh, released an analysis looking at child health outcomes and they actually broke it down by family structure. Like there's seven different categories, right. two-parent family, single-parent, grandmother, and it sure. makes sense. 
And guess what? This data pretty profoundly shows that there is a correlation between certain family structures and much different outcomes in terms of child health. Right. That kind of data just does not exist in public education. In, in economics, in economic research, there's all sorts of data that shows correlation between family structure and economic outcomes. But for some reason in education, it's almost taboo. We have to break that. The NAEP data just came out a couple weeks ago, and everyone's wringing their hands again because once again, data was stagnant yep. and the racial achievement gaps. You know, in West Virginia a couple years ago with NAEP data, the the proficiency rate for eighth grade uh, black boys was 18%, which is horrible. Yeah. The proficiency rate for white eighth grade boys was 19%, which is also horrible. Yeah. But let's say we close the racial achievement gap so that both are now at 19%. Yeah. That is not the victory. That one. is still wrong. Maybe there's something else that is driving these outcomes. And in the absence of not even having data such as family structure, which I think is certainly a factor in some of these outcomes, right. but if we, don't even, if we don't even have the courage to measure it, then we certainly can't manage it. And it doesn't give us the permission to actually say, maybe there are other factors outside of race, class, and gender that could be driving right. some of these differences. So in public prep, you are, you're trying to teach this directly to your students. Uh, give me a little bit on exactly how you're doing that. And as you do that, there's some people that would say, well, you have these things in the success sequence, right? Finish high school and, you know, uh, get married and then have kids, get a job, so forth. And this is a sequence. But there's also going to be some people who say, you know, it's not those things. Those things are reflecting something else that drives those things, whether it's uh, a coherent, um, uh, you know, lessons from your parents about how you grow up and succeed or so forth. So um, how do you respond to those things when you're teaching kids? How do you make sure that you're teaching them actually how to succeed and right. not a sort of cover of the sequence. Right. I mean, what you just said is very interesting. It, it might be that you're growing up in a home environment where you just learn those things from your parents, either by example or it's explicitly right. taught, or you're in a faith-based institution. Somehow you're getting the message to the point where it doesn't need to be taught in schools. Right. Right. So our fundamental premise is, unfortunately, we think we're, our kids are not getting this exposure through all these other vehicles through which they may have right. been exposed to this kind of information. So it is important to us to teach it. Right. Now, the how for us is really important. And we're still in a pilot mode. We're still experimenting. Right. And in some ways, part of why I've embarked upon this journey is to have other schools take on this effort and say, how do we want to engage our students? We're taking the approach that our graduating eighth graders, the second half of the year, we have a class called Life Knowledge, like it's twice a week. Right. And in that class, the first thing starts with speaking to our scholars about what are their life aspirations 10 to 12 years from now, right? The next, so we go through eighth grade, and then the next 12 years of your life is the first, uh, you know, four years of, of um, high school, right. then four years of college, college, and then the first four years of young adulthood, right? right? Because the decisions that are made in that 12 year span will have lifelong impact. So it's really important for us to have our eighth graders leave with this kind of information. So what are the goals that you want to achieve? That everything starts with the goals that you want to achieve. And then we have our scholars say, what are the kinds of impediments will like, that will likely take me off course. Right. And from them, I mean, our kids live in the communities we serve. They see other kids and uh, who are not necessarily achieving their objectives. And so it's things like having a child out of wedlock or not getting a job the, you know, that, that right. pays well. It, so they know it, right? And so then we use the seven habits of highly effective teens as our anchor text. Right. Um, and over the course of 20 or so weeks, we try to embed information about the rewards or consequences of a series of life choices sure. that could involve the kinds of, of majors that you right. choose. But it also should include things like, if you have children out of wedlock or in this sequence, those things matter. Right. And to say that we shouldn't expose uh, children to that um, in, in our view is a, is a disservice and right. it doesn't honor the fact that we want our kids to have personal agency. Right. We want them to have the kind of information 
that gives them the armor to insulate them from the inevitable hurdles right. of whatever kinds of systemic barriers right. that might exist out so there. So the, the life choices are the choices that they have to positively make to affect their lives. That's what you're... I mean, you know, a 12-year-old can't solve the mass incarceration problem, right? No. A 12-year-old can't solve systemic racism and the right. historical challenge that's existed in this, in this country. But a 12-year-old can learn that they have their own personal power to make decisions even in the face of these challenges. Right. And part of why I think the success sequence data is so interesting is that a component of the people who are in the success sequence data are people who are, the, it, who are in the same exact situations or who were in the same exact situations as our kids faced many of the same challenges right. and yet have emerged. Sure. So how do we take the reality that exists, right, and yet give our kids the kind of information that they thrive even despite these challenges, which by the way, all of us are committed to overcome systemic barriers, right. but our kids don't have the luxury to wait. Like, oh yeah, mass and car, that, that, that'll, that'll be solved in a couple of years, yes. right? So, because exactly. we can't have this kind of learned helplessness where, you know, our kids hear constantly of all these systemic issues that are gonna keep them down. Well, if you right. hear that enough, you know what you start to do? You just kind of be like, you know, what's the point, right? Sure. And, and you lose the sense that you have the power right to change outcomes in your own life. Now, some people are going to come at you and for some people are going to come to you and say, you're moralizing. Mm -hmm. You are moralizing. And so um, I have two questions on that. Number one, a lot of attention gets paid to the family structure question as if that is the only argument you are offering. Um, is that a primary part of the offering or is that part of the suite? And then when it comes to moralizing, are you moralizing or are you just trying to teach your kids consequences? I, I'm not sure I can get my head around it. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. I mean, I, you know, the data is the data, right? So you, right. Could, you could say, look, moralizing or not, in, in the same way that we teach our kids, if you go to a four-year college versus a community college right. and you look at the college completion rates of four-year versus two-year, it, it, it's slam dunk. Slam dunk. The, Right, so this is data. It's not more like it's not moralizing that we tell kids right. that, right? Because it's just information that is very That's likely right. to be useful. The two-year path is not morally inferior. It's just <laughs> statistically inferior. Right. Yeah. So if you want to look, so take that to the entire right. span. And that's why I believe the success sequence is so powerful. So first off, it's just data, right? right? For some people, they can't get around the moralizing issues. And I, truthfully, I don't know what to do about that other than to say, this is real. And for many people who have been successful, this is the path that they've chosen right. because they know that that was the best decision for themselves as well as for their children. And it does bother me t sometimes when, when people who seem to be against like sh sharing this information, this is exactly what they're choosing in their own lives. Right. And yet somehow it's moralizing or paternalistic. That's right. Um, so therefore we can't tell that to these right. children who are not getting it in any other right. areas. Don't, I mean, don't preach what you practice, right? Yeah, that, that, we, we have to have the courage to have this conversation. We have to have the courage to start to include family structure in the mechanisms why, by which we measure yeah. uh, student outcomes, especially in education, because we seem to be brave enough to do it in health, crime, economics, all these other areas, right. and somehow in education, it is taboo. Well, Ian, thanks for coming by and talking with us. Best of luck at Public Prep yes. and uh, in this crusade that you're uh, having the courage to take on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Ian Rowe. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And be sure to subscribe for more videos and research from AEI.